process within when you can't see taxi licenses or renewals or just an ad hoc testing that we can do. So that's nothing to confirm that that's under way that those are originally not done. But it, it is a, a we are a, it's an outline cause of casualty. It's, it's, it's supposed to be specific to look at the situation as to the tax issues. Thank you, Chair. Um, in your re the report that we received, um, you mentioned the appendix to this report provides examples of the range of activities under undertaken by Merseyside Road Safety Partnership during 2018. I imagine that was actually the information that we got in the second half of the uh, presentation. It would have been useful, it, it's not included in our papers, it would have been useful to have that information before the meeting. And even though we've had the presentation, some of the writing's quite small to see from the back here. It's still useful to have that information in our papers. Fair point, Chair. If we can arrange that. Yeah, we can certainly do that with the minutes because Helen's right, that's an excellent presentation. But obviously, if people have been able to have it with the reports because it indicates it's meant to be with the reports, we'll just go on and put it with the minutes. That's absolutely great. Jed? Uh, thanks, Chair. Just, uh, I mean, a good report. Um, just what I'd like to see is a little bit more about sometimes partnership working. Um, it may come as a shock to some, but not to others, is that sometimes, particularly with schools, who are not exactly on board working with local authorities and with um, the volume of traffic around the schools and that, and I'm sure that each and every one of the members here is out of running with schools. And I do understand their position because some schools firmly believe that their uh, kind of responsibility only takes place inside the school gates. And of course, that's not, because corporate responsibility goes beyond that. So I'd just like to see something in there that actually includes partners such as schools and others, because that certainly every ward, I would imagine, is a, uh, a problem. Thank you, sir. Yeah, that's something to Um, I'd sort of pick up on those points, if I, if I may. 
Um, particularly as a cyclist who does wear his helmet uh, very regularly. Um, one of the things I'm really pleased to see you doing all that work on um, close passing, because I know that's sort of challenge many of us on two wheels regularly have. There's obviously lots of different discussions about ways that you can deal with that. You know, one idea that was in vogue was about trying to uh, presume liability was with the vehicle rather than the cyclist. And I don't believe that's right, because I think that absolutely can exonerate dangerous cyclists. Um, but one idea I particularly like is something that they have legally in a number of US states, where there's a minimum distance that has to be applied around a cyclist. So if you're in a vehicle, whatever that might be, and you encroach within four foot of a cyclist, you're committing the offence. Is that something that would require national legislative change, or is that something we could do as a local bylaw? Because I think the things like that actually go a lot further than holding workshops where we pull a driver to the side of the road and say, did you realise this? Rather than having the ability to say, you've actually committed the offence, and because of that you're going to get three points now, or whatever. Yes, Joe, I think that's a, a, a national initiative, but in the incident of if a cyclist have experienced a two quarter pass and um, cause an issue, there is the ability, if you've got the footage, to provide that to the full safety partnership. We have had cases where we've investigated that, and there has been enforcement against that individual on the back of the evidence that we provided. So, as an incident subject, can do that now. We, have, we need, need to, to publish that information, the ability to do that, uh, or promote that. that That's great. And then I also want to return back to the kind of um, the taxi element that you kind of highlighted. And I don't misunderstand what I'm going to say because I believe we've got the best taxi drivers anywhere in the country. However, as has been indicated, there is a small minority that are doing things that are illegal, that are really dangerous. Now, it really concerns me how acute and problematic that is, and perhaps do we need to sort of start to take a, a stronger approach to that? Because if you're driving a train anywhere in this country, or driving a bus for the vast majority of big bus companies, you're subject to a random testing regime, and it's so rigorous that actually the number of kind of instances and offences is now virtually nil because it's so kind of um, strong for good safety reasons, do we need to think about having a proper random testing regime that's operating regularly so we can root this sort of stuff out? Because I'm sorry, 80 odd arrests for drug driving is huge. Yeah, we can't tolerate any of that because the danger it leads to other road users and pedestrians. Do we need to do something more stronger than we've already done? Certainly, and that's the steps we're exploring with licensing authorities.
it's good to see the honesty of where we are in the National League table. That you know, kind of, we aren't the worst, but by no means should we sort of be complacent about that because mid-table mediocrity is nowhere near good enough. So I think we've done a lot there, but there's so much more that we need to do. So if you can be prepared to come back at future events and give us further updates, we'd really appreciate that. But if we can agree the recommendations in paragraph two of the report, if that's agreed, excellent. Okay, moving on to uh, item number six, uh, we've got Liverpool City Region Smart City Programme update and Paul is going to be Thank you, Chair. Um, the purpose of this report really is to update members on um, the progress we've made on the uh, Smart City scheme and the recommendation there to stop the uh, committee and the contents of this report. Provided some, some background, really, it's been a while since it's the last uh, update to uh, Transport Committee, so I thought it was worthwhile, really, to give the committee a uh, full update. So I've tried to, I, I, I kind of went back right the way to uh, concession travel, which I think uh, goes back to 2000 and 2007, uh, believe it or not. But I think the key point here for us in terms of the background is best travel is one of the most active smart city schemes in the UK. So we started with concessionary travel, but uh, English National Concessionary Travel Scheme and our uh, local 60 plus concession. So we now have over 300,000 uh, concession cars in circulation, generating around about 40 million uh, concessionary journeys per annum, uh, obviously all on, on smart city. What we did, um, from a technical point of view, we built upon that uh, technology platform to develop the Walrus brand, so our commercial uh, smart ticketing product. I'll give you some stats in the, uh, the background there. Uh, 30 million people <coughs> saved away in solar. Uh, since we launched saved away in November of 2014, so looks like it's just over four years. Uh, 800,000 Walrus cards have been issued over 800,000. We now have Marine for and Stagecoach uh, weekly products, all sold on the Wallace card. Um, in 2018, we launched uh, Saveway uh, for sale on the uh, Metirail electric stations. Uh, and at the moment, we're currently implementing our rail passage, our uh, season uh, rail ticket. And we've got that as a sort of technical uh, trial. I think the point of this is that the Wallace platform is uh, firmly established as a single smart card uh, for Merseyside. Our smart ticket strategy has been, uh, to date, has been to simplify our products, rationalise those products, and then digitise them uh, in the smart ticketing program. I think 2018 was a bit of a watershed uh, year for the program. Um, the point I'm making in the background is that although we've made good progress here, um, I think we now need to change the, the approach. Um, one of the main reasons for that is to meet the vision of the Metro Mayor, to make the city region a UK example of smart safety and payment uh, technologies. So we're now undertaking a fundamental review of smart safety. And the work's now on the way by the team. Uh, we'll put in place a ticketing and payment infrastructure necessary for the city region to introduce contactless payment technologies across uh, the bus and rail and the deep bridge and the ferry uh, as well. There's still a lot of work to do uh, in partnership with transport operators and increasingly now we're working with uh, Transport for the North. So we're working towards the introduction of contactless uh, Payment technologies for travel across the region, ultimately with the aim of introducing account based uh, travel uh, with a fair price promise for our customers. If we move on to uh, section four, so I'm just going to take you through some of the updates uh, since the last uh, report. So we have established uh, smart ticket funding now for this financial year, and the work's underway. I'm going to put in place that sort of base uh, infrastructure, and I'll talk a bit more about that uh, later in this presentation. Uh, the Apprentice Travel Ticket went 
live on the 26th of November uh, 2018. That allows apprentices aged 19 to 24 access to a 50% discount on our summary weekly and four weekly products. Uh, Accepted 4.3 there. Um, so a live trial, we've looked at this before, the new smart uh, rail pass was launched on the 18th of December. It's still very small scale at the moment. But I think once we, we anticipate by the end of this, this month, I think we should be able to roll out across the whole of the Mersey Rail Network for our weekly uh, smart rail pass. So that's some, some good progress on the rail network there. At 4.5, um, this will be a, a major project for the, uh, for the internal technical team and during the early part of 2019, which will be the refresh of the bus uh, electronic ticket machines. We can't release these to smaller bus operators. They've been in place for about seven or eight years now. And quite simply, we're not, the, the technology deployed at the moment just isn't up to uh, the modern payment uh, technology. So, we plan to replace all of those uh, facilities in the early part of 2019. So work has also now restarted uh, to refresh the concept of the Walls uh, web portal. In fact, we are going to look at the, the branding of Walls uh, as, as um, announced by the Metro Mayor. So we're now planning to go live in the summer of 2019 with the sale of solar tickets. So there's a couple of aspects of this, but when you sell a solo online at the moment, they're currently at the moment, sell solo mainly from our pay points outlets. So we'd be, we'd be aiming to move all of those customers onto online channels. Um, so there's a cost benefit to that, as well as a convenience uh, for the customer being able to buy their, their solo ticket on their phone. <coughs> and finally, in terms of updates, 4.7, Outline business case uh, for investment under the Transforming Cities Fund, which uh, submitted and probably uh, with the investment team. Uh, we submitted that back in November. In terms of uh, resource implications, as I've said, the finance uh, capital revenue funding uh, for this year it is, is in place. And we've also secured some uh, grant funding um, for.
how is that being promoted across the city region and what has the take up been as of yet and is the only way of promoting it because as a young person, you know, 23 who could actually be honest with them and was an apprentice, I've not really heard about it much apart from the initial announcement back in November. Thank you, sir. Um, the Fed Government has been slow uh, today. Uh, I don't think that's uh, unexpected. Uh, we're obviously in the middle of the apprentice year. Uh, it was announced earlier um, this year, sorry, in, in 2018, by the National Government. And obviously, we were working hard to get that uh, launched as soon as possible. Um, but I think, like all of our technology, uh, Initiatives, I think we're, we're quite, um, we don't launch them with a, with a, a great through power uh, straight off. So I think once the system is buried in, I think uh, I would agree that there's a need for more promotion uh, through the, the uh, apprentice agencies and the um, different um, organisations that have been invented. Uh, but today's development has not been a huge table, but it has been over the Christmas period, and I think um, it's uh, come back with the next. Uh, See if we can declare those across accordingly and make sure those are, are recorded. Um, Patrick? Yeah. 
Thanks, Chair. Just a very quick one. Um, the apprenticeship <coughs> support is, is brilliant. Uh, and we need to make sure that any apprentice knows about this. One way to do that would be uh, every single apprentice has to have an induction into their programme uh, to provide us with a private training contract to colleges. One quick and easy way to get the message out would be to contact all the providers and ask them to include information on this as part of the apprentice and induction programme. Alex, do you want to come on that one? Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Just in obviously um, design of the offer and how we um, publicise and promote the uh, apprentice um, smart card, that was really worked very closely with the uh, Command Authority's Employment Skills team for that very reason, because it's too easy to come up with a transport solution, but it is also a public and what the, the need, what the requirement is, and how we can then ensure that the people who need it are made aware of it. Um, as Paul said, um, it's, it's a slow start because of the time we launched it, but also the automation of the technology works. Um, but as we start to come on, we start to see the increase uh, in the take up of that. We're just to ensure that constantly can be there to break those work going on with the employment skills team, but also for the pressure providers across the city region. There's no further uh, questions or comments. If I can uh, move the recommendation to paragraph two of the report, that's great. Excellent. Uh, seventh item is the Williams Rail Review, and we've got uh, Tom and Phil going to present this for us. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Good afternoon, Transport Committee. Um, our paper today is to introduce the Williams Rail Review. Um, so we're asking that you note the content of the report and also um, ask that you grant delegated authority. Um, for the submission of the uh, consultation response um, uh, to the Director of Integrated Transport and Director of Policy and Strategic uh, Commissioning, and that the delegated authority will require consultation with both the Chair and the Vice Chair of this committee. Now, the Williams Rail Review was launched on the 6th of December last year by the Secretary of State Chris Grayling. Um, it has come out of the blue, I think it's fair to say, um, to most people in the industry, um, and is in response to a series of events and um, I think negative incidents that happened um, during 2018 on the rail network and in the rail industry more widely. Um, the review will be led by um, an independent chair, a gentleman called Keith Williams, who used to be the chair and chief executive of British Airways. Um, and it's expected that the review will inform a white paper um, to be published this autumn, um, which will ultimately lead to a uh, reform of the rail industry um, commencing next year, 2020. Um, the deadline for submitting evidence is the 18th of January um, and as a result of that deadline and the launch at the start of last month we are seeking delegated authority from you today um, and we will come back at a later date with um, a summary of the written response because we are still in the process of compiling the response and generating the evidence we need to submit to government um, to ensure that we give a full and frank airing of um, our views on uh, where the industry is at currently. The scope of the review is uh, predominantly focused on um, uh, the needs of passengers and uh, particularly looking at how um, rail services prioritise the needs of passengers, how um, fares are um, uh, kept sustainable um, for passengers whilst also ensuring that the rail industry can meet its own cost base um, and there are other elements around the structure of the industry um, and also how the industry can be better geared up to take advantage of technological change in the future. Um, there are some uh, distinct elements that the review will not cover, um, and that includes high speed to another major project that are already in um, development and delivery, um, and also all uh, railway funding commitments up until the end of the current control period, um, uh, control period 6, uh, starts in 2024. So in effect, what the industry um, is being asked to look at is what comes next. Um, I think, uh, given where the industry is at currently, um, uh, between Network Rail and the other um, interested bodies, they just want to try and get back to some sort of steady state before bringing in um, all the changes that are likely to arise as a result of the conclusion of this review. Um, officers have already commenced engagement with the department's review team. Um, so uh, some informal meetings have been held and some roundtable events have been attended by um, uh, colleagues from across the Travel and Combined Authority and we have commenced uh, the compilation of a written response to provide the review. Um, meet, 
meetings have already been scheduled for post deadline as well to discuss our response with the review team, uh, which I think is um, is quite encouraging that they've approached us and want to speak to us. Uh, we've not had to go chasing them for, for meetings and things like that. Um, ultimately, this review um, uh, really does need our input. Um, we want to make sure that the barriers uh, that we see in the industry in terms of delivering projects, in terms of delivering services, um, issues related to fares, um, issues related to the environment, how we might encourage more rail freight traffic, for example, um, uh, our response will um, include all of these issues um, as relevant to the local city region and Wild authority. Um, we have already um, interviewed the chair of this committee to seek his views. Um, uh, to gain a bit of an insight uh, from a political perspective to add on to the, uh, the evidence uh, based approach we've already um, undertaken. Um, I think that's probably about it, so I'm quite happy to take any questions. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, and I'll just sort of open up because Gordon's got a, um, a motion uh, that it be moving and I'll be seconding. Um, I have to say I'm a bit cynical about this Williams review <laughs> in the sense, as Tom said, it came out of the blue. I think it's come out of the deep Tory blue. And frankly, when I look at the kind of um, the time scale we're dealing with, something that was launched on the 6th of December, then spanning the Christmas period when inevitably um, people are away uh, for legal things like that, with a very, very short time scale of uh, submitting a response to the 18th of January, screams to me that the government's already made its mind up and is just looking for a front to kind of justify what it's predetermined. That said, we obviously have to engage with this and we need to kind of make sure we plant our flag and that's the kind of uh, map out what we believe is the right way to uh, deal with the railway uh, going forward. Um, I genuinely think the team are doing a great job in very sort of difficult circumstances, short time scales, so I um, fully appreciate the fact that we haven't got the full detailed response with us. Uh, what I will sort of commit to you, because obviously it's sound of is uh, dependent on myself and Gordon being cited on it and being comfortable with it. Once we've got that before anything submitted, I will make sure we circulate that around all committee members so everyone is comfortable with what is being sent back with our kind of uh, delegated uh, authority uh, accordingly. So um, that's what I'll say as an open gambit. I might say a few other bits as we go through the debate and the discussion. Uh, but I've got Sue and I've got Jerry, and then I'll actually go on the order to move your motion. <coughs> Can I just say, I absolutely agree with all of your sentiments in this, but I think this is absolutely amazing. We've got a government who has a vision for a world-class railway. So what do they do? They put somebody in who's independent, who is a world-class leader on airlines. That is <laughs> remarkable. So knows nothing at all about the railways, but knows a lot about the, the air travel. So you think to yourself, that is concerning. Not only that is concerning, as Chair's already said, what do they do? They want to hear the people's views. So what do they do? They put out a consultation for a government white paper and closed. So how can we get the word out to people and ask for their comments? Because I tell you what, there'd be an awful lot of people in this city region who would have something to say about the abominable service that Northern Rail have provided for these people. And what do Northern Rail do? Hike the prices up. So I say to you, Chair, I thank our officers for bringing this to us. We are open and we are transparent, even if this government is not and wants to hide things. We have specialist people in this field sitting around this table with our officers. So the views of our people of this city region will be heard, despite the government trying to cover it up in a disgrace. And Northern Rail trying to hike prices up they should be hanging their head in shame and be disgrace. Thank you, Chair. Jeremy? So, speaking as Keith Jeremy Williams, uh, uh, just to make a similar Are comment. you doing a foreigner on this? Or something? <laughs> yeah, 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 this is what you do of an evening. <laughs> no, again, the same thing really. I mean, just always astounded by the government you know, uh, you know, employing these so called specialists. I mean, I mean, I have to say, you know, since whenever was British Airways a good example in transport provision, uh, just absolutely astounded that, uh, you know, the, I mean, if we, as you say, you bear in mind that the chaos that has taken place in the transport 
across this country at the moment, and someone you know, like this is employed, I just think it's totally ridiculous. That's it, really. Thanks, Jerry. Go on. Thank you, Jay. It's um, in line with what you said, I uh, didn't really want our opinions as they what comes to my mind given the, the time. And have they already reached a, a conclusion about where they where they're going to end up because they've made the decision that the, the way money would be uh, found would be through the taxpayer or the passenger and they want to make more of that cost off the passenger than from the taxpayer. It gives no uh, recognition to the fact that investing in the rail infrastructure, the rail services, has got a return to this country, it's got a big return in terms of prosperity and how we develop things for for the nation. And we look back, Chair, you probably recall that it was some uh, just over 25 years ago that the uh, railways bill came in and took away uh, British Rail from operating. That's a, a long time in history now, 25 years has gone past. And we still see a dogma that's attached, a political dogma from the right wing of the, of the country that thinks anything that's run by Public services isn't isn't good. All the commercial things that are run by private companies are good. And so we see uh, the, the likes of Carillion, the prime example of how to hold up the the private um, companies. And we see in the rail industry franchise after franchise not actually succeeding and being taken over into public ownership turned around and then going back. But you think, Chair, wouldn't you think this? Someone applies a little bit of logic to this industry. They apply just a modicum of logic and they say, oh, well, you know, we've got no experience of it in the last 26 years of seeing a, a publicly owned rail being run. <laughs> Strange. I mean, we look at... Uh, SNCF, are they a French national operator? Do they operate in this country? Yes, <laughs> not French. French, you can say, running our railway. Running our railway, when well, we could be doing it ourselves. I think Deutsche Bank, if they haven't been taken over by me, is a company, it's only shareholder. It's the German government. It's running the train. Guess which country, chair? And if you don't get it right, you'll get it right. <laughs> It's running the train. I'm, 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 I'm say, the 26 years it's intervened, we must all be at a loss there. That we still have this way to see. So you'll, you'll see that within my motion, that's part of what we want to correct. And also, I think. An example of public ownership to have cross-party agreement in this organisation, when we've actually looked at what we do with our own role and stuff, how we procured that, we haven't gone out to the normal industry and hired them from somebody else and paid them a huge profit as we have done in the past. We now we've been uh, very careful with how we made our expenditure, saved our money, invested it wisely into the new trains that people are going to be very proud of. Very, very proud of, and we know that for a fact because we've already had the trains as mock ups out in the area, and the, and the number of comments that we've had here, particularly from those who actually want to see improved accessibility to be able to get around the network, we proved it here. So, come on, let's, let's, let's start getting real and say, you know, you really do need to change long term where you've been going and get the passenger bus first and let's change this place around. But do you really think you want to hear my story? <laughs> uh, I think we've, uh, we, we've seen the, uh, the OR, OR doing the Glacier Review, gone through all that. They've identified that there is no one in control of what's happening on the rail network. There isn't anyone in control. It's just, it's just growing loose. So I hope that this motion will be entirely supported by all the members of this Transport Committee Chair. If you want to read that out, Gordon, and then Patrick, I think, wants to well, have a contribution as well. If people have got copies of it, I'm happy. 
not to read it, but if they haven't, I'll read it. Yes, Sammy. The additional recommendations, we recognise that public ownership and operation is a model shown to work and should be implemented across the UK rail network. And then D, that the Roscoe, the Rolling Stock Leasing Company model, is significantly more costly and a publicly owned system, similar to the publicly owned model being used to procure the new Mersey Rail, Rolling Stock should be introduced across the UK rail network. Patrick. <coughs> Thanks, Your Chair. Um, it would be interesting to sit at this Williams review. What, what they should really be considering is, um, as part of the process, is the reasons why the rail markets have actually failed and continue to fail to deliver to customers. And I, I, I don't think they will do that because what, what it will expose is the whole scale failure of the economic liberal model that the Conservative government continues to apply to run the economy in the UK. Um, without giving everybody a history lesson, I mean, this goes back to the Thatcher years when she kind of, you know, this obsessiveness about uh, privatisation, you know, is much better than public uh, ownership. And I think what's happening now is there's that much market failure, and we remember market failure in the finance system back in 2008, which is failure of capitalism. Um, now we're getting increasingly failure in the markets which have been given to run public services. So the fundamental issue is that the whole Tory economic model is broken. And what we need is a new model uh, whereby we can look at public ownership as well as private ownership. I mean, that's what we've had since the Second World War, a mixed economy where you have public and private and not just private. We need to get back to public ownership. With that 100% privatisation spelled. And if you see Sid, you can tell him. <laughs> Chris. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think um, the motion is an interesting motion. Uh, I think we uh, share a certain view regarding the uh, selling off of the family silver about 25 years ago. Um, my issue here is my lack of understanding of the finance issues. Um, what I would like to see to be able to support it is more detail. Because we've got courts that give us information about what we're spending, what we're doing, etc. etc. Um, I couldn't hand on heart say, yeah, I agree with that, because I don't have the information to. So I'm not saying that it's uh, wrong in its, in its uh, tenant, but personally, I don't think I've got the, the information to be able to support. So you're staying the problem. Thank you.